All right, section 1.3 is called Computation of Limits. We've looked at limits from two perspectives so far. Tell me one perspective. How are we looking at limits in the last section? I don't know, man, you think it's like Friday or something. You guys ready to go? How are we looking at limits in the last section? Numerically and graphically. Thank you very much, Nikki. Yes. We looked at these wonderful graphs, and we talked about how we'd move around on the graph. And we looked at these number charts, and we talked about how we move down these number charts and make speculations based on them, right? This is a third way. This is called analytically in some books. Um, computationally is what your book is using, that phrase. And computation of limits has to do with being able to evaluate. So, hang on. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at is just some real basic limits. Um, we have a constant C, so a constant is just a number. So imagine that C is like a 5 or something like that. And we have um, a, and a real number A, so A is any real number that we're approaching. And we're going to look at two basic limits. The first one says that the limit of C as X approaches A is C. And I want to justify that sort of with a picture of what you would be expecting, because everything you expect to be true is going to be. If you have y equals c, some constant, that means you've got something like y equals 5 or 2.7 or negative 5.8, I don't know, you've got something. It's just a horizontal line. So now think about this. If this is a horizontal line and x is approaching any x value on that line, what's the limit? Remember, a limit's a y value. What's the y value you're getting close to on this line? C, whatever it is, because you're actually not moving off the line at all, right? You're staying right solid on that solid straight line. So this one's limit is C, right? Because the y value is C. Let's move that over here. So this one has a limit of C as x approaches any value because we're at a constant line. The second graph, or the second one on this basic limit, says the limit as x approaches A of x is A. So it looks very much like we're just replacing the x for the A. Right? Now think about why that works. We're going to do again picture. This equation is the equation y equals x. Because that's what it says right here, just like the last one was y equals c. What does the equation y equals x look like in a graph? It's a straight diagonal line, or we sometimes would say it's a line that uh, goes straight through the origin, right? Evenly. It sort of breaks the graph in half, but on a diagonal instead. So this is the line y equal x. So think about what has to be true. At any location along the line x, we have the same x and y value, don't we? So if x is 7, y is 7. And that's what this is saying, right? This is saying the limit at any x value is the same value that I'm already at, because that's what this graph looks like. No matter where I go, the same x and y value are present at that point. Okay, so it looks like we're plugging in the number, and in reality, that's what we're doing. It really is what we're doing, is plugging in the number in term into where x is. Okay, the next ones are going to be a little bit more for you to write, and I realize there's going to be some writing. So let me flip to this, and I'll talk while you write. Theorem 3.1 <coughs> starts out by telling you that the limits of f of x and g of x both exist as x approaches a, c is any constant, and then we've got some of the following that are going to apply. Everything on this slide, unlike some things we're going to be doing later in this course, is what you would want to be true. Man, if I were just trying to create something that had some certain properties, these are the properties that I would want. I would want the property that when I multiply by a number for a function, that, and then I take its limit, it's the same as doing the limit first and then multiplying by the function. The order of that doesn't make any difference. That'd be a really nice feature to have, and we get it. It's one of our features for limits. I mean, if I were creating this myself and I wanted to talk about the sum or the difference of two functions, I mean, it'd be really nice if I could just take the limit of each of them separately and then do the addition or subtraction. 
and you can. When we're working with multiplication, same thing. Man, it'd be really nice if I have two functions that are multiplied, if I can find their limits individually, and then multiply their limits together. You get that one too. The last one is the division correlated, uh, correlation for this, and you get it almost exactly what we would, uh, would, would best want. It says that if we divide the two functions and then take the limit, it's the same as taking the limit of each one of them and then dividing them. There is one conditional statement to that. That conditional statement says that g of x limit can't be zero for this to work. Why not? It can't divide by zero, right? We keep coming back to this dividing by zero business, and it's present again in these definitions or this theorem. So if the limit of g of x were actually zero, then number four won't work. We've got to do something else instead. I know it's a lot of writing, so but when you're finished, just kind of look at me so I know who I'm still waiting on. And I'll leave it on the slide till you're finished. Is there anyone still writing? Are you good? Great. Alright, so uh, we're going to do uh, a couple of examples here on how this works. Now, you know two ways to do these problems. We could look at a graph, we could make number charts, correct? And they're, they're both doable options. We, we could do that, we could verify what we're about to do with those features. But let me show you this one because I think you're going to like it. This limit process, this analytically finding limits or computationally finding limits, is equivalently what I said a couple slides ago where I said, notice how it looks like in place of the x, they just replaced that x with a, <coughs> right? And I said, they actually did. You're able to do that on these functions as well. You're able to replace the x with the value that x is approaching. In this case, it's the number one. And the reason that you're able to do that is because of those previous theorem results, right? This actually says x squared, and it has a negative in it, and it has a plus 1. So in reality, I could actually pull the negative out in front. I could take the limit of x times the limit of x as x approaches 1, and x approaches 1. And I can add to that the limit of 1 as x approaches 1. I could break this into all these pieces. That's what that previous theorem gave me. It gave me the ability to break it apart. And then back on there, the basic one, basic uh, property number 2 or whatever, says I can just plug the number 1 into here. Well, this becomes 1. This one becomes 1. And then I have a negative on the outside, right? And this limit is basic property number 1. And that becomes just 1 because it was already 1 to start with. And the beauty of that is that what it means I can do is I can just plug the number in. So what is negative 1, or negative, the quantity 1 squared plus 1? It is 0. Remember what's being negative, that the negatives and this one not being squared, right? It's just the one that's being squared and then multiplied by the negative. And it works just the same down here as long as this value doesn't make the denominator 0. So does this value make the denominator 0? No. So I get all those properties from the previous page that allow me to just plug in the number. So I can take the number negative 3, and I can replace the x with a negative 3. What does the numerator become? Negative 9. Someone else, what does the denominator become? Negative 2. I think it's positive 2 on this one, yeah. Positive 2, good. And that doesn't reduce, right? 
We can leave that as negative 9 halves if it really bothers you and you want to write negative 4.5 or negative 4 and a half, it's okay. But negative 9 halves doesn't bother me at all. That's perfectly fine. So my limit is actually negative 9 halves. Does anybody want to go back to looking at a graph where numbers on a table? No? I didn't think so. All right, we're going to do one that's a little bit trickier now. And it's trickier why? It has three parts, right? This is what we would call a piecewise function. It's piecewise defined is defined on different pieces of the graph. And the pieces of the graph are actually at the end. So this is the graph's equation if you were left of negative 1, less than negative 1. You have the second line of the equation if you're between negative 1 and positive 1. And then if you're bigger than positive 1, your graph actually looks again like that 2x plus 1. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. So I'm going to call this line 1 line two, and line three, just so that I can refer to that without sounding all funny. This has a, my screen actually doesn't match your stuff right now. It should just say, does yours say x is the limit, or the limit as x approaches one? Okay. All right, so one of the things that we talked about in the last section is that when we have a limit, and we have this number one right here, that that actually means the limit from both sides. Now, we didn't really focus on that over here because we didn't have a function defined differently on two sides of a number. But this one does. At the value 1 here, the function changes lines that it's on, right? When it's left of 1, slightly left of 1, we're on line 2. And if it's slightly on the right of 1, we're slightly bigger than 1, we're on line 3 of this, of this uh, equation setup, right? So I actually have to focus and actually have to look at the limit from the left, so one from the left of my function. And I have to look at the limit as x approaches one from the right because they are defined differently. They don't have the same equation. So let's take a look at the one from the left first. One from the left. That puts me on line what? Line one, line two, or line three? One or two, one of them, right? Because the numbers that are corresponding over here in red, now in black, those are all values that are less than the number one. So it has to be on one of those two lines. But as we get closer to the value one, we at some point will end up on line two, correct? So we can move, we can start wherever we'd like, and if we keep moving close to the value x equal one, we will eventually be on the second line of this uh, setup, the second line of this equation. Yes, Nikki. Uh, It doesn't have to be equal to a value to actually arrive there. Remember when we did limit uh, definition in the last section, we said that it's a y value that you may or may not touch? That's why it doesn't matter if we've got the equal to part at all. Yeah, so that's a good point to be aware of. Do you guys see what Nikki's saying is none of these say or equal to? Sometimes they will. But we don't really need them to be equal to something. We just need to be able to get as close as we want. And we can do that without the equal to. Good question. So this line right here says that I'm eventually going to get close to x equal 1. Never going to get there, but I'm going to get close. So if I were to use this line of the equation and plug in the number 1 for x, that is to say, what's the limit of 3 as x approaches 1? Three. It's 3. Right? That's that constant function that we talked about back on the very first slide. This limit is 3, and this is coming from line 2. Just as a note. This one right here, this function, says that we're approaching x equals 1 from the right. That would be line... Not quite. Just line 3 on this one, right? 1 from the right means numbers that are bigger than 1. The first one says x is less than negative 1. That's not bigger than 1. The middle one says between negative 1 and 1. That's not bigger than 1. The last one finally says x is bigger than 1. So this is referring to looking at line 3. So I'm going to look at the equation that's on line 3. The equation on line 3 says 2x plus 1. How do I find its limit? I can plug that number in. So this is 2 times 1 plus 1. 
which is 3. Same limit, but from a very different perspective, right? I, I didn't use the same <coughs> equation at all, but I did get the same answer. And so I've got that the limit from the left is 3, the limit from the right is 3, and while that is part of what I needed to find, that wasn't what I was actually asked to find. I was asked to find the limit, period, from both sides. And because it's the same answer, the limit for this is 3. What if I had gotten one of these to say 3 and the other one said 4? The limit would not exist. So what we're doing is we're comparing these two limits. And if they're the same, then the limit exists. If they are different, the limit doesn't exist. Is everybody good with that? All right. <clears throat>